first of all, I'd like to express uh, how uh, honored I am to be part of this celebration of uh, Marcel Berger's uh, life and work. Um, so he, he had a tremendous impact uh, on, on my own work, uh, the support he provided, support and interest, etc., uh, meant a lot to me. And like Tom said, uh, we met in the early 70s. I met uh, Berger in the early 70s and a whole group of his students. I don't know if all of them were students, but that was my, my sense. Uh, since then, I found out that uh, I, I looked up students on the math uh, uh, signet and also on, on the, um, it, that's right. And, um, and so it, it didn't look like all the ones I knew, so I thought I knew many more. And turns out that I think it's incomplete. So, uh, so uh, but, but independent of that, I, I feel that, uh, so, so he always had, had a large, nice group of students. And from day one, I felt like, oh, this is, these are so nice to be around, and it's nice to be around Berger. And uh, their work and the whole attitude and support uh, really meant a lot to me. In a certain sense, I, I feel like an orphan in Aarhus because I, was, I grew up with topologists. At the time, they were very, very algebraic topologists. So I broke from that and I wanted to do geometry. And uh, so uh, Marcel Berger was really my, my idol and then Klingenberg too, the, the big main figures in, in Europe and, and the world actually at that point. So uh, <coughs> I thought I would talk about, um, I took also the title of the conference literally so I, I wanted to give like a survey, talk about past, present, and future. Uh, on one of the topics where, where Marcel made a, a tremendous impact, uh, namely uh, manifold to positive curvature. Uh, so let me tell you immediately. Uh, so I, I want to focus on, so I'll write this as M plus. So, so manifolds in M plus are simply manifolds with sexual curvature positive. But here comes the beyond part. So the beyond part is I cannot help also to talk about manifolds of non-negative sexual curvature. And I may even go a little bit further because there are very natural classes related to one another. Uh, namely those that are called manifold of almost non-negative curvature. So for now, I'll just write it like this. And I'll explain what this means uh, in a little bit. <coughs> so I, I would, so, so this, this of course is really where uh, Berger has tremendous impact. And much of my own work has been concerned with this area. Uh, but I think I'll focus as much as I can on generalities in this talk. So, so I will focus general results as much as I can. And then things stop quickly, actually. So, uh, but, but still. Um, now, uh, <coughs> so let me uh, just remind you uh, geometrically what this means. So one way to, to, to think about this is simply the following. If you take two uh, vectors at a point P and you look at the corresponding geodesics, as long as they are minimal, the uh, curvature greater equals uh, curvature positive means that the distance between the endpoints is smaller than the distance between the endpoints in the tangent space. Um, and greater or equal just means that they are less than or equal to. Okay, so this is the Hinge version of Toponogov's uh, theorem. Uh, there are many equivalent formulations of that theorem, uh, and all of this started with these comparison theorems, comparisons of Jacobi fields. Um, this uh, the Rao-Juan theorem. It starts out comparison of Jacobi fields that start out by being zero at a point, and then there's Rauch two. I don't know why it's called Rauch two because it's due to Berger. So this is about Jacobi fields that start off by uh, having some value, but covariant derivative zero at the point. Okay? And, and those two are really basic results that led to the proof of Tovodogov's uh, theorem. Okay? So um, now, uh, 
Okay, so I think I will use this board. No. The reason I'm doing this is I thought I had figured it all out to <laughs> avoid these shadows, but uh, it didn't quite work. At any rate, let me start with the most general results in, the, in this, if I take the area as a whole, okay? So there are two, I don't think anyone gets offended, there are two milestone results of general type. One of them is due to uh, Cheeker and Gromol. It's a Sol theorem. Uh, originally, uh, Wolfgang Meyer was, uh, did some previous work with Gromol also. So it simply says the following. If uh, M is a manifold with non-negative curvature, I assume they're complete, all of them, because otherwise we know for Gromo there's no, 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 uh, no theorems, right? So, uh, <coughs> so M is always complete, but non-compact. This implies that M is actually the total space of a compact manifold that sits in isometrically. So M, uh, so there exists a compact submanifold, and this is totally convex, meaning that any geodesic starting and ending at S um, is in S. So in particular, it's really metrically embedded in here, totally geodesic, uh, such that M is diffeomorphic to the normal bundle. So the total space of the normal bundle. And this equivalence is, is up to diffeomorphism. All right, so, <coughs> so this is one theorem. This is, uh, you can th think of it as, a, I mean, I like to think of it as a, as a structure theorem, a reduction theorem, if you like. It's a structure theorem because it tells you what such manifolds look like, what's the structure of these manifolds. So they're all vector bundles over something compact from the same category. So it, it follows here that, of course, S is also in, in the same class. And I should add that um, and this is what's called the soul, of course. <coughs> if, uh, if, if M happens to be in in this class, it, if it happens to have positive curvature, then the soul is a point. And in other words, then M is just diffeomorphic to Rn, which means that I won't talk about it anymore. Okay? So, uh, so th th we have a complete classification of positively curved manifolds that are non-compact in the sense of, of the diffeomorphism type. Okay? Uh, so it's, in that sense, it's also a reduction theorem because now we are reduced to think about compact manifolds, okay? So for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about compact manifolds in these classes, okay? Um, <coughs> and um, the, I mean, but before I move on to this, there's an obvious uh, set of problems related to this, namely the converse problem, okay? So you can imagine uh, given, so let's see how this is working. Maybe it's not working at all. Okay. Uh. No, it's not working. Only if I put it all the way up. Huh? No, this is not going to work. I thought I had these brilliant ideas. <laughs> You see, they, they teach us things that I never learned in, in any other place but Notre Dame. <laughs> if there are two blackboards, they teach you from day one, I think, that you should always start with the one that's behind because of the shadow issue. <laughs> I, it's just like, I can't even see it now, so maybe. I think I'll just give up and, and you will have to live with that shadow, okay? So uh, I'll pull it down again because this becomes much more comfortable for me. But now I started with the back one. God. All right, I'll just say it in words, okay? So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just move on to something else. <laughs> so, so what's the converse 
The converse problem is you give yourself a compact manifold of non-negative curvature and a vector bundle over it. The question is, can you put a complete metric of non-negative curvature on the total space? Okay? Now, this is known to be false in general. There are lots of examples. The first were due to Walshop and Usaiden, and uh, many more since then uh, due to Belagradic and, and Kapovic. Um, all of those examples are examples with infinite fundamental group. Okay? No counterexample is known for finite, in particular, simply connected manifolds. Um, now, uh, so, and, and the original question by, by Chiga and Grimal was if, what about bundles over spheres? Even that is not known, only in dimensions up to the base being five dimensional. Okay? Um, however, Rigas a long time ago in his thesis proved that over spheres, stably it's true. Okay? So you can add a large enough trivial bundle and then it's true. Okay? You can put a metric of non negative curvature on it. And recently, it's been a lot of work by uh, David uh, Gonzalez about all other kinds of manifolds where you stably it's true. In particular, I think by now it's known to take any known positively curved manifold, then it's true all vector bundles over those if you add a trivial bundle. Okay? So that's a reasonable general question. Okay? Um, <coughs> all right, so, so this was the converse of that. So now let me pull this board down again and write down the other sort of general result. Ah, I can't do that now, right? Because I'm not tall enough. Yeah, hmm. This is taking more time than I planned. <laughs> <laughs> when I came, I saw all these boards. I said, oh, I can finish this talk in no time. <laughs> OK. Yeah, I really messed up with this here. All right, so what's the other one? You probably guessed it. If, uh, so this is the Betty number theorem due to Gromov. And it simply says, so, so like I said, from now on we, 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 we uh, focus on, on compact manifolds. So one version of it is the following. If M uh, N, so there ex exists a constant depending on the dimension n. So that's that. If m is in this class of non-negative curvature, then the sum or the dimension of the homology of m, any field of coefficients, is bounded by this constant n. Okay. Now, there's a more general version of this theorem that doesn't care about what the lower curvature bound is. And um, <coughs> I should also add that the same thing is true for the fundamental group. Pi 1 of m is generated by less than uh, some constant also. This one is a very simple, beautiful consequence of Tobinogov's uh, theorem. Uh, this one is, is really hard. It's a deep theorem. And uh, <coughs> it's sort of the, the, the starting point is actually a rough version of this theorem that says that the topology, so, so, but it was proved only after the, the Sol theorem. But if you, if you look at a complete manifold of non negative curvature, then it's of compact type. So that was, uh, that was Gromov's uh, observation, meaning that uh, if you go far enough away, there are no critical points for the distance function to the Sol. So uh, that means that it's, it has the type of a compact manifold with boundary. That really is one of the key starting points in his proof of this thing for compact manifolds. Okay? But I won't say anything more about it. So uh, <coughs> now the, 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 the more general result is for any curvature bound and then a bound also on the diameter. Of course, in non-negative curvature, you don't see that because you can always scale it. You can even go as far as you could say, whatever we're going to discuss from now on, we scale the diameter to be some number, okay? Maybe pi. We like pi for the unit sphere, maybe, or else. And then it's just a question about what is the lower curvature, or the minimum of the lower bound for the curvature, right? That's like a one function on this class of manifolds. 
And uh, this theorem says that if, if that function is greater or equal to zero, then this is true. But there's a value for all of them. Okay? There's a value that depends on this number. Okay? However, that value is really large. And, uh, and so in particular, if we go back to this uh, general situation, it does not uh, distinguish these classes. Okay? You can't... You could say, if you look at this thing, this, it's kind of the same number. There's no, there's at, at this point, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so one of the huge problems, I would say, uh, that is, is that we don't even know that these classes are different. Well, we do at the level of fundamental groups, okay? So at the level of fundamental groups, these are really distinct classes. Here, for example, we have bonnet meyers theorem, the classical theorem. So now this is positive curvature. That's a general theorem of positive curvature. So M in uh, M plus implies pi 1 of M is finite. This is the classical bode meyers theorem. It's true for Ricci curvature even. Um, <coughs> and of course, this is not true for the other classes. Okay, But, so, but actually, you know what the structure is. Uh, you know a lot about the structure manifolds in these other classes. So, for example, in the class M0, you know that any compact manifold has a finite cover, which is at least diffeomorphic to a simply connected one with non-negative curves across the torus. Okay? And what is this last class? Maybe I now should tell you what this means. So what does it mean that M is in this class? Well, it means a couple of ways to say it. One is to say that uh, there exists a family of metrics. Can, can you read this, by the way, up there? Wow, that's impressive, because my handwriting is bad, too. But uh, I'll try to say it out loud. So there's a family of metrics on M, so that the section curvature of M relative to this metric is greater than or equal to minus 1. And the diameter of M with this metric approaches zero. That's one way of saying it. So this means collapse with lower curvature bound. Okay? This is equivalent by rescaling. You can see that there exists GI. Here's another way of saying it. So that the sexual curvature of MI, uh, MGI, is greater than or equal to, let's say, minus 1 divided by I where i goes to infinity. So this approach is zero, getting closer and closer to zero. And let's say the diameter of mgi is a fixed number, maybe pi. OK? So this is, this is why we call them almost non-negatively curved, of course. right? And uh, <coughs> manifolds in this class are not, have not been studied that much. But I think they really are important for understanding the whole picture and for understanding, in general, manifolds with the lower curvature bound. Okay? Just like in the case of manifolds with bounded curvature, where almost flat manifolds play a central role in the work of Chiga, Fukaya, and Gromov. Okay? So that, that's expected, but it hasn't been really developed. All right. Um, by the way, in this class, any manifold in this class, is also finally covered by a compact manifold that fibers over a nil manifold with fiber being simply connected. Okay? But in general, the, the class of fundamental group is larger. But if we move on to assume that M is simply connected, then there's not a single example known that uh, of even going all the way to almost non-negative curves that couldn't possibly have positive curvature. No obstructions are known. Okay. Uh, let me add. Uh, so this is. So what are the other general theorems about positive curvature? They also go back a long time. They go back to Singh, or Singh. So uh, it's also about just about the fundamental group. If M is even dimensional, this implies that pi one is either trivial or Z mod two. This is when M is orientable. And this is, of course, when it's not. Okay? And uh, 
if it is odd dimensional, then M is orientable. And these are results going back to Singh in the 30s. Okay? And all of them are sort of like baby Morse theory in a sense. You look at the minimum general lengths of general, minimal uh, uh, shortest closed geodesic or whatever in the homotopy class, uh, and you show that it has to be trivial. Okay? So this is just a simple variation formula. So in, in this example here, you take a suppose M is not simply connected, you take a shortest closed geodesic, that's non-trivial. You find from the assumptions a parallel field, and you just look at the variation in that direction, and then you find shorter curves. Okay? Um, there, are a, there are several theorems like this, and I actually all put them in the same block. I, I kind them things type theorems. Okay? There's a theorem due to Frankel that says in positive curvature, if you have two totally geodesic submanifolds, they intersect if their dimensions are too big. It's exactly the same proof, kind of. Uh, uh, going back to Weinstein, if you have an isometry in such a manifold, you find fixed points in even dimensions if it preserves orientation. And that, by the way, is very similar to Berger's theorem about zeros of killing fields. Okay? So he proved that any killing field on an even dimensional manifold has a zero. And in odd dimensions, it's true that uh, if you have two killing fields, they're dependent at one point. Okay? So, uh, <coughs> So these are, the, these are the general results uh, that I know of for manifolds of positive curvature without any further assumptions. Okay? <coughs> so that's end of story in that sense. Okay? Um, there's much more work that has been done, but all of it with additional assumptions. So for example, what, uh, what Marcel did, of course, was prove the quarter pinching theorem. Uh, and he, he, he proved other things, very interesting things for positive curvature. But these are not like completely general results, okay? So uh, I'm trying to stick with completely general results at this point uh, and see what, what else one can do. All right, so uh, now I want to move on to some basic conjectures. And uh, this is really not working well. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. I know the theorem, so I don't need to see it. Okay, I can't see it. All right, so what are some main conjectures? Maybe I'll give up and just put this one here, and then, then do it reverse afterwards. Okay, so uh, we can't avoid Hopf, and there was mentioned by, by Bruce earlier today. So there are, uh, Hopf has two, there are two basic conjectures attributed to Heinz Hopf. One of them is that the Euler characteristic of M is greater than or equal to zero when M is non-negatively curved. And actually it should be positive when M has positive sexual curvature. And the other one, the one that Bruce mentioned, is, is the question whether S2 cross S2 is in or not. I guess if it's a conjecture, the conjecture was if it's not, but maybe Hopf asked, just asked the question. So, okay. <coughs> now this, this has two very natural, more general related questions, I would say. So uh, one, uh, one is the following. If you take two manifolds, N and V, and take their product, there is not a single such example known to have positive curvature. I'm not saying conjecture or anything. I'm just saying there's not such an example known okay, yet. Uh, so, of course, here's what we're talking about as two crosses two. Well, I mean, this is not, if I take them to be simply connected, okay, take them to be simply connected. So RP2 cross RP2 doesn't have positive curvature, so, so I, the zoom N and B is simply connected. 
Uh, <coughs> and the other direction is, uh, how about um, you could think about symmetric spaces, M in, and, and I'll use, I, I guess this goes back to Bess, this notation, maybe, I think so, right? Uh, compact rank one symmetric space, okay? Yes. So S2 cross S2 has rank two, okay? And uh, you could ask this question for any symmetric space of rank at least two. Is there a... Not, 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 right? Plus. I'm saying it shouldn't shouldn't have positive curvature. Yeah, but you higher rank, higher rank. Higher rank. Higher rank. Oh, <laughs> yes. Ah. The <laughs> oh. Uh, then I can't attribute uh, this. Ah, I just wanted to do that. Uh, right, symmetric space. Darn. Symmetric space. Thank you. Of rank greater than or equal to two. Yes, thank you, of course, that's what I meant. Yes, the other ones do. <laughs> All right, so these are, these are basic questions. And uh, here's a basic uh, conjecture due to Bot. that says that the, uh, if we look at the, um, if M is also in this class, then the sequence of Betty numbers of the loop space of M grows at most polynomially. Okay. Uh, there is a, a. This is. Um, I'm not sure this is the formulation Bart had because it's not in any. It's not written down, but. Um, Bart wrote a paper with uh, Berger where they looked at pinched manifolds, so in this class with two bounds of the curvature, and they provided estimates for the Betty numbers, but they're way from this, way off from this. They are the exponential growth. They are estimates in terms of the pinching, but they have nothing to do with this conclusion that you would like. Okay. Um, <coughs> now, if you focus so you could uh, also, another question is, are you thinking of any field, like in Gromov's theorem or whatnot? Okay. But if you, if you, so here we could say F, and this could be any field, maybe. That's a reasonable conjecture. Uh, but it, it becomes really obviously interesting, uh, in, in particular, there's a lot of consequences, if you take F to be the rational numbers. Uh, because then this condition is actually equivalent to the following, that the dimension of, of the homotopy groups, the rational homotopy groups, is finite. <coughs> okay? So this follows via the minimal model theory of Solomon and so on and so forth. This is old also, right? This is also way past. Okay? Um, now, this by itself, has, I'll just write down, it has lots of consequences. That, that have been proved topologically. One of them is that the Euler characteristic is then greater than or equal to zero. This follows from this, okay? So, so the Bott conjecture would imply one part of the Hopf conjecture at least. The other part is that it's, it's so, so which suggests what to try to do if you want to prove the Hopf conjecture, if you believe Bott's. So, because being positive for the Euler character is then equivalent to all odd rational Betty numbers to be zero. Okay, so in a sense you might as well just prove that to prove the Hopf conjecture, right? So, all right. Another consequence is related to Gromov's theorem, and it is that the sum of Betty numbers, rational Betty numbers here, is at most two to the n, where n is the dimension. See, that's a good bound, right? And um, in general, to distinguish these classes, one might want to prove just bounds that would allow you to distinguish them. That's what maybe one possibility, but that's, uh, that's really all I wanted to mention here. Okay. <coughs> now, um, 
So, uh, given this bleak situation about general results, uh, I'd like to provide some other bleak news about how many examples do we know of this, okay? So, examples. and constructions. So what is a, what are, how do we, we construct examples? Well, uh, the, uh, so, so let me talk about some constructions first. So um, if you start with a manifold M in M0, and we look at, at I'll call these projections, So look at, at, a, at a, like a quotient map, m to n, pi, where this is a Riemannian submersion. Then this implies that this guy is also in this class. And you might be clever or lucky or whatever and show that sometimes it is in this class. Okay? That's a very important construction. Um, now, if you look at uh, if you look at this class, <coughs> Tom and I went out together last night. I lose my voice too now. <laughs> um, if you look at this class, then you can take products, right? Products in this class work, of course. Um, and then there's the bundles, and I would say in this class. What do I mean by bundles? It's the, that's the converse of this one in a certain sense. This is a very hard direction to go in. So basically, you start with something, you start with, with something, a base, in a class, and you have a bundle over it, maybe a principal bundle, maybe a principal G bundle. I'll just stick to that right now. Then it follows that it, when B is in this class, that P is also in this class. So this is a way to construct many examples of almost non-negatively curved <coughs> manifolds that doesn't work in either of these categories in general, right? It's, it's, that's just why this inverse, the converse of the Sol theorem is very hard, right? So to go up to bundles is, is very, very difficult, right, to construct metrics. So, uh, <coughs> so these are some of the constructions. Uh, there's one other construction, um, and that this I'll, I'll just call them special gluings. And uh, Jeff was the first to, to make such interesting constructions. Namely, for example, and now, now I can use my word cross, okay? So if you take M and N, okay, compact rank one symmetric spaces, then Chiga proved that their connected sum has a metric of non-negative curvature, okay? Basically using the, the uh, if you cut out uh, <coughs> a point from one of these spaces, you have a bundle and you change it so that it becomes product near the, near the boundary so that you can glue them together isometrically with a, by means of unit sphere. Uh, and there are other constructions uh, about gluings that have to relate it to uh, to uh, manifolds of cohomogeneity one that uh, Wolfgang Tiller and I developed, uh, but let me just uh, move on. So these are the examples, and they have led to the to to the following. These are constructions that have led to the following examples. So uh, to to get started, you need you you need something. Okay, I'm not right. So the main source for examples to this day. Uh, just Lie groups, compact Lie groups. Or Lie groups with binary metrics. Because they 
uh, if you take a binary metric, they belong to this class. Okay. So therefore, you can you can uh, you can do all these constructions with them. Okay. So you can take quotients. So all homogeneous spaces have metrics of non-negative curvature. The ones with positive curvature have been classified by Berat Bergerie, uh, uh, and and actually, so. The examples constructed started with Marcel's work on the so-called normal homogeneous basis. There are three of those, two in dimension 7, one in dimension 13. And then uh, Wallach constructed, classified the, the even dimensional examples in dimension 6, 7, and 24. I have no idea if that 24 has to do with Brendel's number. I don't think so. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, <coughs> And then Aleph and Wallach constructed a whole infinite family in dimension seven. Okay, and that's it. All right. So, so, so if we look at homogeneous examples from this class, um, there are of course the crosses that were always there, and then there are the ones you have to work for to construct, and they exist in dimensions. I'll just write down the dimensions, 6, 7, 12, 13, and 24. 16 is one of the crosses, the Cayley plane, kind of also unusual. But there is one example here, it's a flag manifold, one example, another flag manifold, one example, another flag manifold. This is uh, Berger's example in dimension 13. And then there are infinitely many here. Taking quotients, you can also take what's called biquotients. Okay, so so these are denoted. Um, I really would like not to move on to another board. So um, so a group H can act on both left and right. So we have a subgroup of G cross G acting on itself, uh, maybe freely, and then these also have all have metric of non-negative curvature, of course. And uh, there you get many more examples now with positive curvature. Okay? So you get more examples in dimension 7 and dimension 13. These are due to Essenburg, you have infinitely many. And here, due to Bazaiken, you have infinitely many examples. And that was where the situation stood um, up until uh, recently. So, uh, <coughs> so these are, these are the uh, constructions and examples that you have at your disposal. Of course, in non-negative curvature, you can do a lot more, right? You can take products, you can take quotients, and this and that. So uh, that's why you get so many more examples. Now, uh, <coughs> so let me move on uh, to see what uh, what you might do, since since if you're really not able to prove, uh, uh, let's say, Bruce's suggestion that uh, you can find positive curve metrics on this two cross two arbitrarily close to the product metric or anything else, or prove that Hoff, the answer is no, you can't find such a metric, or anything else, you've got to do something, right? And uh, various approaches, you could look at the pinching problem, pinch curvature, etc. It doesn't really need, lead to new ideas, I would say. Uh, you could even look at the pinching of the size in terms of the, the diameter. Does, does also not lead to really new insights and new examples or anything. So what you can do is, you can study all these examples and see if you get new ideas about manifolds of positive curves or non-linear curves or whatnot. Or you could try to <coughs> find more. Okay? One way to try to find more is to say, let's try to start over again and say, let's admit it, we can't do this in general yet, let's just see what we can do in the presence of symmetries. So like Bruce explained, in dimension 4, if you have a circle of isometries, you can actually prove what the manifold is. The manifold, if it has non-negative curvature, it's either S4, CP2, S2 cross S2, connected sum CP2 plus minus CP2. And you even know the action up to equivariant diffeomorphism, so complete classification. Okay. And so you might, you might want, wonder what you can do in general uh, so let me just write that down here. So let's study. 
the classes. M plus, M zero, and M zero minus in the presence of large or special isometric group actions. And it's not completely unreasonable to do it. Uh, for certainly, um, broad insight in dimension four, but um, all the known examples have a, a fair amount of symmetry, all of them, right? So you could ask, is that how much does it take to, to classify? And it actually might give you new ideas to construct new examples as well, okay? And this indeed has happened. So let me just uh, give you two examples of a notion of large. So what could it mean that if a group G acts on M, that uh, this group G is large? Well, one notion is obviously that the dimension of G is large relative to the dimension of M. This is called the degree of symmetry, also studied by Wu Yi Shang, or studied topologically by many people. Uh, you could think about the, uh, the rank of G being large. So you take a maximal torus, or just think of torus actions that play a role also in collapse, manifold with bounded curvature. So the torus groups are certainly important. Um, another way of thinking of large is if the so-called cohomogeneity, which is the dimension of the manifold module of the groups so of the orbit space, that this one is small, okay? So I will, uh, <coughs> oops, I will uh, tell you about some results. Um, let's see, what should I do? I think I should bring back, since we all, oh, I want that one down. Maybe now I'm really oops, not so fast. Okay. So I will focus on um, just the rank condition. So, so this one. So suppose you have a torus that acts on a manifold M isometrically. And here for the, for the <coughs> so in, in this situation, I'll assume M has positive curvature. And uh, <coughs> what you can show, for example, is in this case, is that the, uh, the dimension of K cannot be too big. It can be at most roughly half of the dimension. And if it is, you can tell what it is, the manifold. It's, a, it's actually like a cross, okay, up to diffeomorphism. Um, <coughs> now, um, uh, Wilking showed that you can do better. You can go down to about, uh, K is about one, fourth of the dimension of M, and you can still say what the manifold is. It's rough, again, like a cross, up to ten tangential homotopy equivalents. So this equivalence is up to tangential homotopy equivalents. Uh, <coughs> But uh, there are also ways to uh, address these questions due to Hopf in this setting. And uh, Lee Kennard has a number of results related to this, um, namely answering 
basically addressing uh, the, uh, the Hobbes questions. Forget S2 cross S2, but think about the other ones for positive curvature. So, um, with uh, K growing uh, logarithmically um, as a function of n, as a logarithmic function of n, uh, there are many there are many results. Uh, he has several results showing that then you cannot have a product. M not a product. And M, the Euler characteristic must be positive. So, so what does this mean? So, of course, in this case, if, if here K grows linear, it's like one, one fourth of the dimension, grows linearly, right? Uh, and then you can say a lot, you can say what the Betty numbers are and everything, right? So in particular, this is true and they're also not products, right? That they are just like crosses, okay? But if you have uh, much slower growth, in, so this is interesting in high dimensions, of course, in particular, then you could still conclude that you can't have manifolds with this amount of symmetry, torus symmetry, uh, and, and M being a product of two manifolds. There are examples like this. And also you can conclude that the Euler characteristic is positive. Okay? Now here's the most spectacular work in this di direction that just happened very recently, at least in my mind. So, so this is joint work due to Kennard and uh, Wilking. So it simply says the following. If M is in this class, simply connected, and T5 acts on M isometrically, then the oil characteristic of M is at least two. So this is, this is an amazing result in the sense that this is, doesn't matter what the dimension of M is, right? So it has some symmetry, but it does to tell, no matter how big dimensional manifold or positive curve you're looking at, it's one of those with positive Euler characteristics. And, and they can do more, apparently, than this. Okay? This is proved studying the uh, fixed point sets of this and the topology of the fixed point sets. And uh, so this is, this is really something. Okay. Uh, how am I, what, uh, where am I supposed to well, stop? You can go a little further, but. I think I'm about out. Okay, so I will skip one part, but uh, let me just say, uh, let me just add then that, um, so in the other, in the other direction, uh, with the other notion of large, they say the cohomogeneity, Let me, uh, okay, let me just state the result in words. So again, Wilking has a, has, has a fundamental result that says if, if you fix the cohomogeneity to K, no matter what it is, could be 10 or whatever you want, then if the dimension is large enough and it's not like one of these Gromov numbers, then the manifold is, uh, is of the type of a cross, okay? If it has that cohomogeneity, okay? So for example, Look at the uh, homogeneous that are gone somewhere. How many did they dried up in dimension 24? Okay, and beyond that, they're only the crosses. Okay, so in cohomogeneity one, uh, Zilla, uh, I, and, and, and Wilking proved uh, gave a s s sort of a, uh, an, an exhaustive class of possibilities that is a classification in all dimensions but seven. Okay. In all dimensions but seven, the result is the following. They are either a cross, a normal homogeneous base, or they are some infinite family of Bazakian examples and we know exactly what they are. Okay? In dimension seven, there are, the, there are the two normal homogeneous bases. These are the only homogeneous ones. And then there's an infinite family of the Eschenburg examples that also are cohomogeneity one. 
And then there are two infinite families of candidates for positive curves. So that was what I was sort of driving at, right? And uh, so, so in cohomogeneity one, there are like PK, QK candidates. of new manifolds of positive curvature. I should say immediately that P1 is the seventh sphere, so this doesn't count. And Q1 is one of the first Olaf Wallach example, we call 1, 1, the normal homogeneous one, actually. But um, P2 is known to be now is in this class. This was proved by Derriacut and independently by myself, uh, Verdiani, and Zilla. Um, by the way, Verdiani did the even dimensional classification before we did the odd dimensional classification of these. Uh, very recently, uh, Dariacard uh, has uh, claimed that he can also do P3, Q2, and Q3. Okay. So, so these, are, these are new examples of manifolds of positive curvature, and so it sort of validates at least that this is not a bad approach to, to try to find new examples, okay? And not even to speak of cohomogeneity 2 or whatnot, and I had meant to talk about cohomogeneity 2, and the only reason was that there you can prove that if you are cohomogeneity 2 and in this last class, then uh, you, you satisfy the Bott conjecture, okay? Then you're rationally elliptic. Okay. Um, I also would like to point out, and we'll finish by that. So, if we go back to this list of examples, uh, cohomogeneity zero means homogeneous. We already saw that all the ones they are all in M zero. Okay, I don't need to think about the almost non-negative curve. Cohomogeneity one. These are three distinct classes. Okay, we have this very strong restrictions to positive curvature. There are lots of examples that have non-zero curvature, but there are lots of examples also that do not have non-negative curvature, okay? But they all have almost non-negative curvature, right? In cohomogeneity 2, most do not have almost non-negative curvature, period. But the ones that do, you can analyze, and in particular they do, they are rational elliptic. Okay, so let me stop here. Questions? Come now, at least one question. <laughs> what else is in the future? Yeah, well, I didn't have time. <laughs> uh, well, what I, what I, the, I had a couple of things I wanted. So, first of all, there's this question about why are only these crosses in high dimensions? What's going on? Maybe there's something to it, okay? Or is it just because we are too ignorant and construct all examples, don't know how to construct examples other than using Lie groups, okay? Now, from, from that point of view, I think, um, so, so uh, there's a lot of constructions now. Uh, and, and we know much more now about a, a very interesting generalization of group accents, namely so-called singular Riemannian foliations. So these are locally everywhere equidistant, uh, uh, I mean, leaves, but they don't have to have the same dimension, but they are locally everywhere equidistant. These are called singular Riemannian foliations. And there's an abundance now. Marco Radesh has done a lot of really nice work uh, on unit spheres, for example, not at all homogeneous. And so there's got to be a lot of examples of these in other, on other manifolds, right? And, um, and there's recent work of uh, Martin Karin, uh, Christian Schanka, and Goethe that uh, showed that all exotic seven spheres, now we know that all exotic seven spheres have metrics of non-negative curvature. And this uses what Wolfgang and I did, but they took quotients, and one way of looking at the quotients so that they looked at these constructions were they, uh, that um, you can think of these as as the cohomogeneity one picture with like a singular Riemannian foliation where all the principal leaves are biquotients. 
instead of being homogeneous bases. Okay? So this is sort of like a hybrid between really general singular Romano foliations and homogeneous ones. Right? But it, it shows that there are definitely interesting uh, ways to think about these items in, uh, in this context of singular Romanian foliations. So, so I, I, I think that maybe one could construct examples that way. Another one was there's a big old problem in, from the beginning of Alexandrov geometry that says that, um, that the boundary of an Alexandrov space should be an Alexandrov space with the same lower curvature bound. That's completely open. But recently, Peterson and I, and a, and a student of mine, uh, uh, Adam Moreno, showed that it's true for leaf spaces of singular Romanian foliations. So maybe another source is to look at all these general objects, take the boundary of such a thing, has non-negative curvature maybe, maybe positive curvature. In some cases, there are manifolds. Maybe you can do deformations and so on and so forth. So those were some of the things I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Well, if, <clears throat> if there are no further questions, thank you very much.